Good evening. The Hubble Space Telescope continues to send back amazing pictures. Just look at this, the Cartwheel Galaxy. Clearly, one galaxy has invaded another, a fantastic cosmic collision. A much nearer home, a picture of the planet Saturn with a new white spot, a glorious view, although at the moment, I'm afraid, we're losing Saturn in the evening twilight. But this evening, I want to stay very much inside our own solar system. Ask most people what is the most distant planet in the Sun's family, and the usual answer is going to be Pluto, discovered way back in 1930 by my old friend Clyde Tombaugh. Well, that picture was taken in 1980, I may say. But at the moment, this is not true. The solar system is divided firmly into two definite parts. We begin with four small solid planets, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. Then there's a wide gap in which move thousands of very small bodies, known variously as minor planets or asteroids. And beyond that, we come to the four giants, beginning with Jupiter. And beyond Jupiter, there are three more giants, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And there's also Pluto, which simply does not fit into the general plan at all. To begin with, Pluto is small, smaller than our moon. It goes around the sun in 248 years, and for most of the time, it's further away than Neptune. But at the moment, it's not. Its eccentric orbit brings it inside that of Neptune. And in 1979, Pluto came within Neptune. In 1989, it reached perihelion, it's closest to the sun. And not until 1999 will it again pass beyond Neptune's orbit. Well, I may say, Pluto's path is also tilted at the fairly sharp angle of 17 degrees, so there's no danger of a collision on the line. But at the moment, anyway, Pluto and Neptune don't go anywhere, anywhere near each other. But that is by no means the end of the solar system. Believe we live that much further out, more than a light year, a light year being six million million miles nearly, there's what we call the Oort Cloud, named in honor of the Dutch astronomer Ian Oort. And this is believed to be a cloud of icy bodies, Obviously, we can't see them. They are too far away and too faint. But if one of them is perturbed for any reason, it starts to plunge inward toward the sun. And after a journey lasting for hundreds, thousands, or even millions of years, it invades the inner part of the solar system, and we see it as a comet. But in 1992, there was an entirely new development. Over in Hawaii, David Jewett and Jane Liu, using the 2.2-meter telescope there, detected a very different kind of body. It looked like an asteroid. There it is, uh, distinguished by the circle around it. But it was clearly a long way away, and it was something entirely new. They gave it a nickname, Smiley, after a character in a novel. But that name certainly won't be accepted. And at the moment, we call it 1992 QB1. And since then, more than a dozen similar, very remote objects have been discovered. At this stage, I'm delighted to welcome, once again, Professor Ewan Williams of Queen Mary Westfield College. Welcome back, Ewan. Nice to be back, Patrick. Nice to see you. Well, you've been involved in this research from the outset. Yes, it's a very exciting time to be involved in the discovery of a brand new class of objects in the solar system. Uh, I was very lucky to be around when good telescopes became available and good instrumentation. And we had time in September 1993 with Alan Fitzsimmons and Donald Cayley from Queen's University of Belfast to search for these objects. We are using the Isaac Newton 2.5 meter telescope which is situated on the Palmer on top of a nice mountain yes, I know. Um, which gives us good seeing good clear skies and it has a good telescope the Isaac Newton telescope yes, itself it together with good CCD large-scale CCD facilities and using these CCDs we obtained a series of images and on a fairly early one we discovered a slow moving object we see it here in the top left-hand corner with a circle around it. In a couple of hours, it had moved, and we see it coincident almost with this sort of fussy, sort of irregular galaxy. And then one day later, it had moved more or less across the image and is seen in the bottom right-hand corner. That's 1993 SC, isn't it? That's 1993 SC, yes. And I understand you found another fainter one. We also found 1993 SB which turned out considerably fainter. And if we see, look at the image of 1993 SB, we can see that it really is a lot fainter. Nevertheless, it does move in the same way. And if we wait for another day, we see it is moved more or less across the image there from left to right. How did you know that these things were so far away? You get a clue from the fact that they're moving so very slowly. Um, in the solar system, things close to the sun move fast, things far away 
move very much slower. But when we look at these objects, we've got to remember that what we're seeing is their motion against the background mm -hmm. stars. We're sitting on Earth, we look at the object and we see it against the background stars. The Earth is moving much faster than the object and if you like overtakes it on the inside, things you're not allowed to do on the motorway, but the right. Earth can do it. Um, and the path of the object against the sky then appears to be in a retrograde motion. Now we know how fast the Earth is going, so we can subtract the speed of the Earth from this apparent ret retrograde motion, get the speed of this thing in orbit. Then if we assume it's a circular orbit, it's a very easy calculation to work out how far away it is. But how do you know the orbit is circular? You don't. <laughs> and for most of these, all we have is a very, very small arc around the time of discovery. Um, you have to assume something to get a distance, and a circle seems as good a guess as any. Fair enough. Now, for 1992 QB1, for example, that's now been around for a number of years. Uh, we have observations of it in 1993, also observations of it in 1994. And if you stick all those together, then the circular orbits, um, the blue orbit on this diagram of the solar system, looks quite a reasonable representation. It, if you assume a circular orbit, you find the object more or less where it is. So it's moving outside Pluto on a near circular orbit. Well, so much could be one, but I gather that 1993 SC moves in a very different way. Yes, 1993 SC, to start with, was somewhat nearer. It moved somewhere between Neptune and Pluto rather than outside Pluto. But more interestingly, even three months after discovery, the predicted position and the position according to the circular orbit, again the blue one on the screen, was actually slightly off. As more observations came in, the error between the circular orbit prediction and reality became greater and greater. And it became obvious that one needed a different orbit. Now the trouble is, as soon as you go on an elliptical orbit, not only does aphelion become greater, perihelion, the distance nearer the sun, becomes smaller, and it gets close to Neptune. Mm. And Neptune can disrupt these orbits. Yeah. So one needed some method of keeping it stable. And Brian Marston, that's the person who sends out all this information on the IAU telegrams. Very well too, I may say. He does a very good job there. But he also has a brain. Yes. Um, and <laughs> he produced a very neat solution for, for this thing. He suggested that 1993 SC could well be moving in an orbit very similar to that of Pluto. By that I mean that it was an eccentric orbit and the period was 248 years or thereabout. Something almost exactly like Pluto. Now Pluto does this very clever trick and at 1993 SE is presumably doing it as well. By that I mean it manages to go round the Sun twice in exactly the same time as Neptune goes round the Sun three times and here we see Neptune has now just completed one orbit, Pluto is far away. Neptune is now coming up, has done two orbits and is now rapidly catching up with Pluto, coming in. overtakes <laughs> it and Neptune has now completed three, and there Pluto is back in the starting position again. And so this configuration repeats itself time and time again, and we never get close encounters between the body and Neptune, so we have this nice, stable orbit with a period of 250 years. What we call resonance. What else yes. could you find out about 1993 SC? Well, by pure luck, or beginner's luck, <laughs> um, if you remember, the first image we had of 1993 SC was actually very near the top left <laughs> of the picture. Very near the edge, yes. When you're searching for these things, um, obviously you don't know it's there, otherwise you wouldn't be searching. <laughs> right. So you're taking images of different parts of the sky, and of course you want to overlap so you don't miss things on the corner. We took a nice overlap, and we found 1993 SC twice. Being in the middle of the night, you sometimes don't think too clearly, so we thought, oh, we found two of these things. <laughs> so we kept observing both of them. The end result is that we finished up with about 12 observations of 1993 SC, many more than was really required in order to confirm its existence. But that has its advantage, because we were able to work out the brightness of 1993 SC in each and every one of these images, and one could find out whether the brightness changed or not. And we did indeed find that it did. It changed by actually just over a magnitude. We can see it very bright, then dims, and goes bright again, and then down again. Um, and it appeared to be doing this in a period of order of eight hours. Now that tells us two things about 1993 SC. It tells us, A, that it's not spherical. You need to be elongated to get a 
light variation. And also it tells us the rotation period is either about eight hours or possibly about 16 hours if you think we're seeing it twice. Full of interest. Ian, how many of these remote objects do you think there are? Probably millions. Um, but we only know of 18. 17 if you read the literature up to two days ago. <laughs> um, but last November, um, Alan, Donald and myself had a night on the Palmer, only one night unfortunately, and we thought we had discovered another one. But one night is not enough to confirm the existence. Fortunately, we had another night two nights ago, and I'm glad to say the object was recovered two nights ago and has now gi been given a temporary designation 1994VK8. So there are now 18 of them. Many congratulations, but I gather there are two definite classes of these remote objects. Those whose paths keep them well out beyond Pluto, and those whose paths are very similar to Pluto's. Is that fair? Yes, I, I, I think we have examples of both of them. 1992QB1 and this object we have just discovered now, those are very clearly outside the orbit of Pluto, moving on nearly circular orbits. On the other hand, 1993SC and a few of the others would appear to be on this um, Pluto-like orbit, that is, they're on an eccentric orbit, probably in resonance with Neptune. Now, that's nothing to do with the other difference which we appear to see in, on the screen, which is that some object appeared to be at 3 o'clock <laughs> and another collection at around sort of 9 o'clock. Yeah. Now, that is nothing but really observational selection. We happen to get telescope time around September and around March. What about sizes? Sizes, again, for the 18 we've got, vary from something of the order, say, of 60 miles. 60 miles is, roughly speaking, the area within the circle of the M25, <laughs> to something considerably bigger, are of the order, say, of 200 miles, which takes you, roughly speaking, from London to Liverpool. Now, there are other strange things, too. And I'm thinking, of course, of Chiron, discovered way back in 1977. And um, there's a picture of Chiron, that blob in the middle, and you can see that kind of fuzz over to the upper left. That appear to be a kind of a temporary atmosphere, so we don't really know quite what Chiron is. Certainly, it goes around the Sun in a period of 50 years and spends most of its time between the orbits of Saturn and Uranus, so that, again, is rather different. But certainly, we are now finding objects in the remote part of the solar system. Why do you think that they weren't discovered before, Ewan? I think there are two reasons, one of them being that they're very faint, um, we've got, got to remember that things like 1993SC, which is one of the brighter ones, is 22.5 magnitudes. Others are 23, even approaching 24. Now, that is actually fainter than the general background yeah. sky. And you can only, therefore, detect them if you have some mechanism almost of removing um, the background sky. And that really only became feasible when CCDs became available and in particular when they would become large enough so they can look, a, look at a significant area of the sky. So I think that's a technical problem that we couldn't do it was one reason. The other one that's, was that until recently, nobody really probably looked. Why not? I think because people for a long time were happy with the view they had of the solar system with comets coming from the Oort cloud through perturbations uh, and then falling into the inner solar system. Um, problems became, became apparent when you start looking at the distribution of the inclinations of the long period comets, it appears to be pretty random with a peak um, mm. at 90 degrees. They can come from any direction, yes, in other words. Whereas if we look at the short period comets, they're very, very different. They all seem to lie very, very close to the ecliptic in the same plane as the planets. People had thought that the reason for this may well be the gravitational field of Jupiter and Saturn, maybe perturbations pulling them down into the plane. But recent detailed models show that this really is not possible. You can't um, pull these random orbits all into the inclination, and you need some other explanation. Well, what do you think the answer is? I think a simple answer is to say there is a belt out there somewhere of comets of these objects um, and, occasion, uh, and occasionally these then move into the inner solar system. Now this belt one would traditionally perhaps call uh, the Kuiper belt. Yes, because it was first suggested I think way back in 1950 by the Dutch astronomer Gerard Kuiper and he believed that this thing was there. But only recently have we actually found Kuiper belt objects. 
That's right. We've got to remember, of course, that Kuiper was not predicting a belt for the sake of a belt. He came upon it um, through thinking about the origin of the solar system. He thought that the solar system would actually build up through the accumulation of planetesimals. The idea is very simple. There's a swarm of small bodies around the proto-sun. Those near the sun move faster than those on the outside and catch them up. They collide and build into bigger and bigger objects. Um, those near the sun build up very quickly. Those further out take a lot longer to catch up and build up. And at some point, you run out of time. And we suspect <laughs> that you run out of time just beyond Neptune. And therefore, there's only a swarm of protoplanets beyond Neptune. Well, it seems that very reasonable. And I just wonder, what is a Kuiper belt object going to be like? Well, there's an impression of one. Whether it's accurate, of course, we can't tell. But it could be icy. It could be cratered. It might be a non-spherical in shape. And if you could go there, it would be a very, very desolate scene. Bitterly cold, of course, and even the sun appearing is only a brilliant point in the blackness of the sky. And I wonder whether anyone actually will see that. And there's another point, too, Ian. We've now got these Kuiper Belt objects right, but there have been suggestions for many years there might be another large planet out there, way beyond Neptune and Pluto. We've been calling it Planet X and having a look for it. What do you think about that? I think it's a fascinating idea, but um, the existence of Kuiper Belts think tends to mitigate against it. It says that Kuiper was right, that time to build up big planets has run out after Neptune. We can't build up big things out there. And that would suggest, therefore, we are now seeing, if you like, a planet which didn't make it in the Kuiper belt rather than Planet X. I imagine that now these first objects have been discovered, people like you are going to go on making very energetic searches for more Kuiper belt objects. Well, I think we need two things. We need to find lots more so we get some idea of the sizes and the size distribution. We also need to make sure we understand what the orbits of those we've already found are like. Like I said at the beginning, out of the 18 so far discovered, only six have anything like real orbits. The rest are just guesses at circular orbits. So we'd more time to look at all the of those we know, as well as finding new ones. Once you've found these things, is it difficult to keep track of them? I think if we get to telescope time about once a year, unless the orbits are absolutely crazy, they should be within a reasonable CCD frame of where any predictions produce them. Therefore, we should be able to recover them after a year interval. And, and so if you get that time, it's all right. Give, us three, give a gap of three or four years, and it gets a very different problem. Well, certainly, it's an entirely new study and a fascinating one. Johan, thank you very much. Thank you for asking me, pleasure. Now, Rebecca, don't forget, if you want the latest information, then you can ring up our Sky at Night information line, 0891 or you can dial up CFAX, page 615. And when I come back next month, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Peter Catamurl, and we're going to talk about the planet Mars, now nearly at opposition, a bright red star-like object shining in the evening sky among the stars of Leo. So, until next month, good night. <laughs>